Now is to try to derive uh, some of the standard results of uh, thermodynamics such as the classical ideal gas and its equation of state from statistical mechanics. We already have some mechanism laid in place for the partition function and then now the task is to show its connection with thermodynamics. Now there are several ways of doing this and I have been debating as to which is the best or simplest model system in which one can do this. Uh, I still I do not think there is an unambiguous answer to this. The classical ideal gas is in fact it is a very simple system, but it requires further physical input. We have to make several approximations which I would have to justify which we will do uh, and this might uh, give the impression that this theory is extremely approximate which is not true. Uh, on the other hand there are other problems where the energy levels are discrete in a quantum mechanical situation and then the calculation becomes easier and the calculation looks more transparent. So I am still at uh, in two minds as to which one to start with but probably we should stick to the traditional path and go to the classical ideal gas and look at that. So let us do that this is our aim but in between I will also juxtapose in between some discussion on probability distributions because this is something we have been promising for a while. So maybe we take a little digression do that and then come back to this uh, main problem. So first uh, we need to make a connection with thermodynamics between what we have been doing so far so that is crucial and let us try to do it and again I do this in a sort of heuristic way and our aim is actually to compute quantities and not so much to go into the formalism itself therefore I am going to give short shrift to uh, formal derivation and simply do things by uh, more or less heuristic arguments wherever they will not affect the results and whenever we need to be very careful I will certainly be so. Uh, recall that the canonical partition function z was uh, equal to a sum over states e to the minus beta times the energy of each state for any given system in thermal equilibrium with a heat bath at some temperature T which is beta inverse okay. We also wrote this as a kind of uh, Laplace transform in the continuous uh, case it was equal to dE e to the minus beta E so let's write this as e to the minus beta E rho of e, d e from some lower bound to an upper bound whatever it was 0 to infinity in general okay. Now of course the kind of gas the kind of system we are looking at I already pointed out would be one where this density of states is a very rapidly increasing function of the energy goes like for a collection of particles it would typically go like the energy raised to the number of particles which is an extremely rapidly increasing function. So although that is the exact partition function if you plot this quantity as a function of E I look at what this integral does then you see except in quantum mechanical situations where you have to be extremely careful and compute this number this thing here this rho of E is a very rapidly increasing function of E and therefore it goes up in this fashion this is typically rho of E. On the other hand E to the minus beta E is a decreasing function and falls off exponentially so the same argument as before falls off exponentially and when you multiply the two together the dominant contribution is going to be from some point in between 
where the curves intersect and this quantity the integrand e to the minus beta e rho of e is in fact going to look like this the product is going to look like this peaked about some point e bar okay. therefore to a very good approximation this is also equal to e to the minus beta e bar multiplied by this number here this gives you the number of states in an interval d e some finite resolution about this point here and therefore this is nothing but omega of e bar. Well, that is what the total number of states accessible microstates is. Okay. Now, E bar is some kind of average energy, but look at what this formula implies. If I take logs on both sides, it says log z and then is equal to log omega of E bar minus beta E bar, and I multiply through by k t, which is beta, and take a minus sign here and you end up with minus k Boltzmann t log z is equal to k Boltzmann t log omega at E bar minus E bar itself. But now in statistical mechanics the entropy is defined by Boltzmann's formula. So, let us write that down Boltzmann's formula. says S is defined as k Boltzmann log omega. Okay. So, what does this tell you and E bar is the average energy which you are used to writing as u. So, it is really telling you that u this quantity here did we miss a minus sign this becomes a plus right plus and a minus because I took a minus here minus k t. Okay. It says u minus t s is equal to this quantity but of course this is a quantity for which we have already got a name in thermodynamics this is equal to the Helmholtz free energy f. So, this is what establishes the connection with thermodynamics namely you should say that this z which is a sum of exponentials can also be written as equal to e to the minus beta times you see it is e to the minus beta times a whole lot of energies and these energies have nothing to do with the temperature they are system properties. But if I say the sum of exponentials which is not a negative quantity can be written as e to the as an exponential itself e to the beta times some effective energy this quantity is some effective energy it is got dimensions of energy here because 1 over k t s dimensions energy. So, that effective energy if I call it f that is what the Helmholtz free energy is. So, the whole idea of writing the Helmholtz free energy is to say can I write this positive quantity as e to the minus beta times an effective energy that is the free energy. That effective energy of course, will depend on the temperature of course, because you cannot say you see, e to the minus beta e 1 plus e to the minus beta e 2 and so on e 1 e 2 are independent of temperature, but if I insist on writing it as e to the minus beta times a single energy then of course, this will be a function of temperature very complicated function of temperature hmm, and other variables like volume number and so on. So, this is how the Helmholtz free energy is defined in statistical mechanics. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. For a free particle, that does not. What happens at all? It increases like e to the power three halves or something like that, right? Rho of e, the density itself increases like e to the power a half because. Does it mean at very large energies, the density of states will be very Yes, it's infinite. You have lots and lots of states, but, but, as we know the probability with which this thing is going to occur is going to keep decreasing. So, yes you have a lot of possibilities available, 
but the probability of taking on any of them is going to be sharply cut off by e to the minus beta e. That is the whole point because what is the physical reason for that? Because in a crude way what is happening is the fluctuations in this system are being driven by the environment which has maintained a certain temperature T. And the moment you have a temperature T, it is a kind of bath and this temperature T implies that on the average each bath degree of freedom has an energy of the form K T. So, one of them goes and punches your subsystem and transfers energy K T and then there is interaction mutual back and forth etcetera. Now, in order to pump this system up to an extraordinarily high energy, you must have a coherent punch from all the bath degrees of freedom at the same time that is improbable very improbable. So, it goes one at a time little jumps here and there and therefore, the average energy is maintained at some finite value and it is very improbable that very high energies are attained. That is the reason for this minus here. This is really where this came from. It says it is very improbable that you will have a coherent punch from a random thermal bath and that is why you end up with this very uh, damp, very large damping factor at high energies. Of course, this increases no problem this is an exponential cutoff and that is more powerful than a power law increase here no matter how high the power law and therefore, the partition function will be finite. So, in a way this really summarizes everything although it is not a proof by any means I actually worked backwards I use the same symbols, but the whole idea the proof of the pudding is in the heating. If with this identification of S and this identification of F I run through this machinery and produce for you the correct classical ideal gas equation then you know that things are consistent completely. So, I have again avoided formal derivations in order to motivate things and tell you in a physical form what the meaning of this kind of statement is this part and what is the idea behind the Helmholtz free energy. It is simply writing this partition function as an effective e to the minus beta times an effective energy. So, f is minus k t log z we are going to use that because our claim now is that if you go ahead with this from the Helmholtz free energy we can derive all sorts of thermodynamic relations we should be able to derive everything we need. What is our strategy going to be? Well, let us uh, write this down. I know that f so now I will without any hesitation instead of E bar use the symbol u which is what we know in thermodynamics. So, f is u minus T s this implies d f is d u which is d u minus T d s minus s t t and of course, d u is equal to T d s minus P d v plus mu d n and then minus T d s minus s t t. So, it was just a Legendre transform and therefore, this is equal to uh, minus s d t minus P d v plus mu d n. And one of the things we want to calculate is the pressure which is equal to minus delta f over delta v keeping t and n constant. So, all we have to do is to find out what this f is compute it and we will do that from statistical physics. We start from this formula we find what z is then compute minus k t log z and after that you put that in here differentiate with respect to the volume and out should come the pressure. And if you get P equal to R T over V or N K Boltzmann T over V for N particles, then we know we are right completely. So, that is the strategy. We are going to use this formula which is a general one. Okay. I wanted to appreciate that it is obvious, but I wanted to appreciate that all these relations are independent of the classical ideal gas. They have nothing to do with it. They are completely general statements. It is just that now I am going to go ahead and derive the equation of state for a classical ideal gas. I emphasize this particularly because there is often the impression that the only thermodynamic system in the universe is the classical ideal gas and everything has an equation of state P V equal to R T. That is of course, not true there is no classical ideal gas it is an idealization and it cannot as we will see it cannot be consistent as a description of anything down to absolute 0 it is completely impossible for reasons which will become clear. Here. So, we are going to use this and then I come back to that formula and do that. So, now let us try to write what is the partition function for a classical ideal gas 
I am going to do this in a sloppy way first and then depending on the kind of questions that arise, we will make it become more and more careful. So, I am going to push many things under the rug and depending on how alert you are, we will come back and justify things. So, I have this volume V with n particles and the assumption is you have point particles of equal mass m and they are zipping around and they undergo elastic collisions with each other, nothing more and this whole system is in contact with some heat path which maintains the system at temperature T. Okay. Then what is the partition function Z equal to and I start by arguing that all these particles are independent of each other and therefore, since I want to compute a sum over the number of states uh, over the states of gas that means states of all the particles all the microstates that are accessible e to the minus beta times the energy of each state. Now, I argue that because there is no interaction between the particles the energy is in fact the sum of energies. Of course, that is not true at the instant of collision, but now let us look at time scales. The collisions are practically instantaneous, so they are really a set of measure 0. Anytime I look at this gas, you cannot find anything actually touching. And now, what does it physically mean? There is a time scale involved. The collisions are due to electromagnetic interactions finally between the molecules, and electromagnetic interactions have a time scale typically of the order of 10 to the minus 15 seconds or less. So, that is such a short time scale compared to the time scales we are talking about here compared to the no time scale at all thermodynamics means everything is stable and stationary. So, very very long time scales that we neglect that. So, we assume the collisions are instantaneous. Okay. As a matter of fact in this room each gas molecule is actually undergoing collisions the interaction time itself is 10 to the minus 15 seconds or less, but even the time between collisions is very very short it is of the order of a tenth of a picosecond. Okay. So, in a picosecond it already has undergone 10 collisions and has forgotten its initial velocity completely. So, this is really in a very very fast equilibrating system. So, if I write this as equal to e to sum over states, so therefore this E can be written as the energy of particle 1 plus the energy of particle 2 plus etcetera where the superscript labels the particles, then each particle is independent of all the others and therefore takes on exactly the same possible energies. There is no preference between the particles and this immediately factorizes the number of states of the entire gas factorizes this product factorizes into sum over states of any single particle times e to the minus beta epsilon where epsilon is the energy of that single particle raised to the power n. This is the great advantage of having a probability distribution which is an exponential because if that exponential is a sum then of course, the probability distribution factors. Okay. Now, you see this is very reasonable it says since these particles are all identical they are moving around and assuming they are distinguishable. So, right now there is no question of quantum physics at all. The total partition function can be written as the nth power of what you could call the partition function of a single gap, single particle. Okay. Then the task is to find this thing here and this particle can be anywhere inside this volume here and it has only kinetic energy no potential energy at all. Therefore, you could write this as equal to an integral because now it is phase space of this particle which is this volume times momentum space. So, d 3 r over the volume V can be anywhere in the volume d 3 p which is the momentum space because it is in phase space both x and p are involved in three, three dimensions e to the minus beta p squared over 2 m because that is the kinetic energy p squared over 2 m. Okay. But this is the volume of phase space available integral over the entire phase space available to a particle weighted with this e to the minus of the beta a factor the Boltzmann factor. 
but that is not the number of states we have to really sum over the number of states and the number of states is found as you know by partitioning phase space into cells of size h Planck's constant in each dimension. It could be a multiple of h it does not matter because we are going to take the log anyway and then that is going to disappear. Remember our physical quantities would come from taking the log of that z finding f and after that finding partial derivatives with respect to microscopic variables. So, constants like Planck's constant would disappear from the theory completely. Even the mass of the particle is likely to go away unless it appears in very specific places. Notice the mass of a molecule has appeared here. Okay. Now, what is this equal to? This is equal to the volume divided by h cube because there is no term here in the Boltzmann factor which involves the coordinates. When would that fail? If you had interaction between the particles then of course, the coordinates of different particles would appear and you cannot do this anymore. So, this is why the classical ideal gas is very simple or if I put the whole system in some field in gravitational potential for example, then there would be a term here which would involve also the potential energy and then you cannot do the integral over the volume so easily. So, we look at a problem of that kind too because then it is clear that the air in this room if it is subject to gravity the density at the bottom is greater than the density up there and that factor is missing now because there is no gravitational field or any other field. So, it is a free gas and you have V over h cube and you have to do this integral. This is a three dimensional integral you can do it in many ways, but obviously the simplest way to do it is to simply write this as d p x d p y d p z and use the fact that you have e to the beta p x squared p y squared p z. So, this also factors and a typical integral would be minus infinity to infinity d p x e to the minus beta p x squared over 2 x and similarly for y similarly for z and it is just multiplied, but this is a Gaussian integral and what is this equal to? We know e to the minus a x squared is square root of pi over a where a is positive and a is uh, now here beta over 2 m. Therefore, this is equal to 2 m k Boltzmann t to the power a half 2 pi. And you have 3 of them in each case. So, this is 2 pi m k Boltzmann t to the power 3 halves in 3 dimensions. And the whole thing has to be raised to the power n. What happens next? We have to find f and therefore, f equal to minus k Boltzmann t log z which is equal to minus n k Boltzmann t log v times 2 pi m k Boltzmann t to the power 3 halves over h cubed. I hope I am right. Yeah, so, I am taking log of this to the power n is n log the same thing. So, that is it and then therefore, p equal to minus delta f over delta v p n this is equal to n k Boltzmann t delta over delta v of log v keeping t and n constant. So, this is kept constant, this is kept constant and I differentiate only with respect to v and you have delta over delta v log v. Hmm? And the minus sign goes away, this minus goes away against this minus sign and therefore, this is equal to n k Boltzmann t over v, which is the classical equation of state. There is p v equal to n k Boltzmann t. If you have one mole of it, then n is n Avogadro and times k Boltzmann is the gas constant r. So, we have indeed derived the classical equation of state and that is come out correctly. I am asserting that this tells me now that this connection we made with thermodynamics is right and this 
T is indeed the right T, the statistical T is the thermodynamical T, the statistical entropy is the thermodynamic entropy and so on. Okay. There are other corroborations, independent corroborations which one can do. For example, you should ask what is the average energy? This is immediately a question that arises. What is the average energy? And that is not hard to compute because we already have a formula for it. Uh, our formula was u equal to minus delta over delta beta log z, right. We had a general formula for the average energy and we have a z. So, so we have this guy here and k t is 1 over beta. So you put a beta here and you have to do a delta over delta beta log this and the power that comes out is 3 over 2 n for beta and this already has a minus because it is in the denominator and those two cancel and what does this give you? It says 3 halves n k Boltzmann t 1 over beta if you take log beta and differentiate it which is the same as k b t which is correct too because this immediately says that u over n equal to average energy per particle equal to 3 halves k Boltzmann t. I divide by n and then I get 3 halves k Boltzmann t which is the equipartition theorem. Each degree of freedom has half k t. Now let us dissect this a little bit. Where did this 3 halves come from? Where did this 3 halves come from? It came from here and where did this come from? It came because I am in three dimensions huh? and where did the half come from? It came from the Gaussian integral. Hmm? This half came from the Gaussian integral directly and why did that come? Because you, why did this become a Gaussian integral? Because the energy is quadratic in the momentum. Hmm? So that is the genesis of this three halves here. The reason you got a half k t per degree of freedom was because that degree of freedom appeared in the Hamiltonian as a quadratic function of the corresponding dynamical variable. You got a p squared and then you integrated e to the minus p squared and you got a half, right. So this tells you that every quadratic contribution to the Hamiltonian will give you exactly the same answer, a half. So for instance, if you have a vibrational degree of freedom, you pretend this is an oscillator, then there is a p squared from the kinetic energy and there is an x squared from the potential energy and that is also quadratic and therefore for each vibrational degree of freedom, the average energy would turn out to be per particle would turn out to be half k t plus half k t which is 1 k t. So if you recall when you do specific heats of diatomic molecules and you look at vibrational degrees of freedom, you add a k t there not a half k t per degree of freedom. But this whole thing comes from the fact that every term, every dynamical variable in the Hamiltonian which is appears in a quadratic form is going to contribute a half k t due to this mechanism here. Had that been different, suppose I had oscillators for which the kinetic energy is p squared over 2 m plus the potential energy and suppose this were anharmonic oscillators and the potential energy was x to the power 4 then what would happen is that the kinetic energy would give you an answer half k t on the average but the potential energy would give you a quarter k t and then per degree of freedom the total energy would be three quarters k t. So although factors are innocuous sometimes they have deep implications. So this is where this thing came from three halves came from the three is the three dimensions the two is the energy momentum relationship is quadratic E is proportional to the square of the momentum. We are going to do black body radiation when we do quantum statistics later on and then you will see that this is completely thrown out of the window. You are still in three dimensions so that three would still appear but then the energy is linearly proportional to the momentum E equal to Cp for a photon and therefore that would turn out to be different. This two would not appear at all but there are further complications. You have what is called Bose statistics obeyed by those particles and therefore this would turn out to be t to the power 4 completely change. Hmm. But for classical particles this is where 
the equipartition theorem comes from. It comes from the fact that every degree of freedom which appears in a square form in the Hamiltonian is going to contribute half k t to the average energy per particle. Okay. Now, with these two, we have actually seen what the classical ideal gases can do. I mean, this is it. So, if you actually put these two together, you have u is this and p v equal to n k Boltzmann t. So, this immediately implies that uh, p v p is equal to uh, n k t, but n k t is two thirds u and I divide by v. So, it is two thirds u over v equal to two thirds u. This, this is energy density. average energy density. The average energy per particle, uh, per, per unit volume sorry, per unit volume. This quantity has exactly the same dimensions as force per unit area which is pressure and the right way to write down the equation of state for the system is to say the pressure is two thirds of the energy density, internal energy density. The 2 comes from that quadratic relation, energy is the square of the momentum and the 3 comes from the dimensionality. This relation remarkably will be true, this kind of relation is going to be true even for quantum gases provided they are ideal gases. And then it will turn out that if you have photons for example, this would become a 1 and this would remain 3 and you would have one third u and this would indeed turn out to be the case. So, although P would have a complicated formula, U would have a complicated formula, the ratio <laughs> turn out to be very, very simple and for all ideal gases this, this kind of relation is true. P is some number times U and you can read off things from this number here. Okay. Now, what is the assumption I made in deriving this? We can go on to derive other things which we are going to do and we will run into a problem very shortly, but what is the assumption I made here? The main assumption I made was I could write the energy as a sum of all those guys independently and then I said I just sum over each one of these fellows separately. But you have to also ask is this really true? How many states are actually available? What kind of error have I made in doing this and did I take into account the fact that different molecules are indistinguishable? I did not. I did not. One molecule is exactly the same as another. So, kind of schematically you have to play, pay attention to this because uh, the fact is, the physical fact is these molecules are indistinguishable from each other whereas I pretended they are not and that is going to lead to some trouble because if for a moment I write uh, the energy levels in a discrete form. So, this is particle 1 ground state, second, third etcetera, this is the first excited state, third excited state etcetera just for illustration and say the first particle is in the first state here the second one is in its ground state, the third one is up there and so on. I am counting over all these possibilities, but if these particles are indistinguishable, then even if they do not interact with each other, if you had the first particle instead of this you had it here and instead of that you had, I am sorry, instead of this you had it there and therefore, instead of this fellow is exchanged here and goes here. This configuration is not distinguishable from the earlier configuration it has to contribute exactly the same thing. In fact, it is the same state in some sense mm -hmm. and we have over counted by saying these fellows are independent we have over counted. Mm -hmm. There are other ways of saying this and when we do quantum statistics I will come back and we will fix this problem. We will be very careful about how to change this method of counting. One thing is very clear instead of saying that this is particle and this is level our bookkeeping has gone by saying, we are saying where is the first particle, where is the second one, where is the third one. We sum over all these possibilities and then multiply the whole thing together. But if they are indistinguishable, we should really ask how many fellows are sitting in this level, how many are sitting in this level, how many are sitting in this level and so on. And in a nutshell, the difference between classical and quantum statistics is to do instead of a column wise tally, you do a row wise tally. To do that, you get quantum statistics. 
and that is why you talk about occupation numbers in quantum statistics. You are not worried about which particle is occupying a given level, you are only worry, worried about how many of them are there and that is it and that will give you the correct counting statistics. We will see this problem crop up even classically and then we will try to fix it subsequently by going re, taking recourse to this kind of argument. Okay. For the moment, let us go ahead and do the other thing namely and I am going to do this and then point out the problem here and we will come back to it. Notice that f was also equal d f was equal to minus s d t dot 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 and therefore, s is equal to minus delta f over delta t keeping v and n constant. So, in principle I should be able to take this f and differentiate which I have got out there differentiate it and get the entropy of the classical ideal gas. But what is going to happen if I did that? So, this is equal to s is equal to if I differentiate this uh, there is a term which is n k Boltzmann log v times 2 pi m k b t to the 3 halves over h cubed that differentiate this uh, this quantity and then there is uh, um, plus some constant because if I differentiate log t with respect to t I am going to get a 1 over t that cancels against this and then there is some constant appears there. This is not good news because if I go to t equal to 0 this blows up and it is unphysical. Of course, you would argue against it by saying look I know that the classical ideal gas is a theoretical construct and it certainly cannot be expected in real life to go right down to absolute 0 because I know in real life whenever you take condensed matter or a gas and then you cool it down it would condense it would become beyond a certain temperature it become a liquid and then it becomes a solid and therefore, this whole thing is out of the window completely. There are interactions definitely there are interactions and as the temperature gets lower and lower this tendency for the interactions to dominate would increase and things would condense and therefore, it is not fair to do this. I agree with that this is a good argument that this thing cannot be extrapolated down to 0, but there is a more serious problem with the formula for the entropy here which we will fix subsequently it is called the Gibbs paradox and we will fix it and it has to do with this counting of states with indistinguishability. So, it says really you cannot get away with this, but for the moment let us leave it in this form and see what happens as you uh, proceed. So, we could do the rest of it we can compute chemical potential for example, because we know how to differentiate with respect to n and let us do that let us compute what the chemical potential is. So, d f is s d t minus p d v then was it a plus mu n mu d n or a minus mu d n the plus mu d n. So, we know that uh, mu is delta f over delta n keeping v and t constant let us compute that. So, mu for the classical ideal gas equal to the derivative with respect to n and that is equal to minus k Boltzmann t log v 2 pi m k b t 3 halves over So, this is what it looks like as it stands, but I am not too happy with this formula either and the reason this is not a very sensible formula is that what do you think is wrong with this formula? What do you think is wrong with this formula itself? There is a serious problem here. Or a multiple of it and so on, but then you could always argue saying this formula is not very true to very low temperatures. So, this is not the difficulty, but there is a serious problem here even with ordinary thermodynamics and that problem is related to the Gibbs paradox I talked about. You see the fact is I expect this free energy to be an extensive quantity. I expect that if I double the volume, I double the number of particles, keep the temperature exactly the same, nothing should happen. So, the free energy should be simply proportional to n and then whatever else multiplies it should depend on intensive quantities. 
but there is this very uncomfortable V sitting here. Had this been V divided by n, I would be very happy, it would depend on the density because the n proportionality is outside, but that V is sitting inside and this is a serious lacuna. So, there is something wrong here, this is not cannot be the right counting, this cannot be the right counting and we have to fix that problem. So, even the chemical potential will turn out to be wrong, not come out right. So, we have to fix the fact that we made two, two drastic an approximation somewhere and this has to be straightened out. Now, what was the approximation we made? We said these fellows are all uh, completely independent of each other and therefore, the partition function is simply the nth power of the quote unquote partition function for a single particle, but it did not take into account the fact that these particles are indistinguishable. Now, how many ways can you take n particles and arrange them among various levels? Hmm? How many permutations are there of these particles? n factorial. So, one way of fixing this would be to simply divide the answer for the partition function by n factorial hmm? and say I over count it, so I divide by n factorial. That is the number of ways in which you can mix these guys, but that is not that is too simplistic that is simply too simplistic because of the following fact. Had the particles been like this and now let us be honest now, these are the possible energy levels of each particle. Had the particles been like this, there is one here, there is one there, there is one there, there is one there and there is one uh, in the one that is free. Uh, I need one more there is one there and so on, then this argument is perfectly right because it says whether this guy is in level 2 and this fellow is in level 1 or vice versa does not matter and there are n factorial ways of doing this and therefore, I can divide the answer by n factorial and be done with it, but what about a possibility like this? What about a possibility where this fellow is also here? Right. Then the division by n factorial is not the correct answer. What I should do is accept these two particles, the remaining fellows are all in different levels and therefore, I divide by n minus 2 factorial and these two particles if I interchange is a 2 factorial that comes out. So, whenever there are coincidental levels, I have to treat that separately and of course, you can imagine now when this becomes a continuum and you have a huge number of levels possible, the question is what factor are you going to divide by? then I have to separate the partition function into a contribution where all the particles are in different levels plus a contribution where all of them are in different levels except two of them and then except three of them, four of them and then there are different levels and so on and it becomes virtually impossible to count. But luckily for us, luckily for us, if the number of levels available is much, much larger than the number of particles you put in then the probability that any two of them is in the same level is going to be negligible. And now for the gas in this room that is exactly what happens. So, I want to say this again, the true partition function z is equal to some sigma over all the particles in which the level i is not equal to level j, not equal to etcetera, where i j referred to the levels of particle 1 divided by n factorial a contribution where i not equal i equal to j, but not equal to k, not equal to l etcetera and then divided by 2 factorial n minus 2 factorial plus dot 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 infinite number of huge number of such terms. Now, if the number of levels is much much larger than the number of particles and I toss these particles in, then the probability of this or that or that happening, if it is negligible, I can throw out all these guys, throw out all these guys and do this alone. But here you got to be careful that you do not count the possibility that two of them would be in the same level. If you do, then you have over counted again. But once again, the correction to that, the mistake you make by doing so counting would be negligible. So, again you remove this restriction and sum over all levels possible for each of them. Huh? 
So, there are two compensating mistakes that are made in the classical ideal gas and really the numbers are such that there is no mistake at all effectively because we will see we will make a count for the gas in this room for example, nitrogen at uh, normal temperature and pressure the number of levels available will be of the order of 10 to the 32 for 1 mole of the gas. The number of particles is 10 to the 24, 23. So, you are 9 orders of magnitude away and therefore, if you have this factor of 10 to the 9 what is the or 10 to the 7 even what is the probability that 2 of them would be in the same level. One, 1 part in 10 to the 14 that 3 of them are in the same level is 1 part in 10 to the 21 and so on and therefore, completely negligible. So, this is the reason why this crude way of fixing the problem works completely, but we need a criterion for when it is going to work and let us give that criterion we will talk about this criterion it is related to the chemical potential, but I want you to understand that there is really not a very bad approximation at all it is a very good approximation provided this statement I made is valid namely the number of levels available is much larger than the number of particles. So, what you have to check is is that true if that is true to that accuracy the statements I am going to make are true. So, let us put the fix in and see what happens I correct this by this fudge factor incidentally it was a fudge factor because this was done before the advent of quantum mechanics and it was done by these two people. Sakur and Tetrod and this is a correction that he made that they made and it worked. So, the idea was that you took z equal to v over v times 2 pi m k Boltzmann t to the 3 halves over h cube to the power n and divided by n factor. So, once you do that you are in great shape because this n factorial we can use Stirling's formula for this n factorial and replace it by n power n e to the minus n. So, you can certainly write this as equal to v over n 2 pi m k Boltzmann t to the 3 halves over e h cube. Where E is the base of the natural logarithm, not the charge. Now, you could ask what about the square root of 2 pi n and so on, it is irrelevant because the whole thing is completely you are going to take the log and that is completely negligible, it is completely irrelevant. But notice this magic has been affected, namely this guy here, this V has been replaced by V over n, and that is an intensive quantity. So, all the problems with the classical ideal gas except serious problems of what happens as we go to absolute 0 are fixed are completely fixed. Of course, it will not give you the correct entropy of the uh, system as you go to absolute 0 because the system is not going to be a classical ideal gas as you go to towards absolute 0, but this problem of uh, the paradox and so on are going to be resolved as we will see. Now, what is the criterion? I will end with that what is the criterion that we need in order to uh, settle this. Well, the criterion is as follows it is really buried in quantum mechanics once again because as I kept saying even counting the number of states in phase space requires you to put a Planck's constant in there. It did not play much of a role because when I take these logs it disappears I could have multiplied it by 3 instead of Planck's constant square root of 3 times Planck's constant would have done exactly the same thing it would disappear, but if I want absolute numbers then I have to worry about it. I really have to start up fresh and do this and that cannot be done at the classical level because we know that at bottom ultimately these are quantum objects. So, you really have to use quantum physics from the beginning and derive things completely and pass to the classical limit subsequently, but let us see when we expect the classical limit to be valid what is going to happen. Well, two things first of all the particles are indistinguishable and secondly in quantum mechanics we know that the position and momentum of a particle cannot be specified with arbitrary precision at any instant of time. Therefore, 
in some vague way these particles are really some fuzzy objects some wave function which tells you the particle is in there with high probability no? and you have another of these guys out here and so on. If it turns out that the average distance between these wave packets is much larger than the spread of the wave packet itself then you can say this is particle 1 is here particle 2 is here. Now of course you cannot say that when they interact because when they collide and go off there is a little black box coming in there. So if you have an incident in which two particles collide and out comes this and that so this was particle 1 and this was 2 and this is 1 prime and 2 prime what has happened here is that 1 comes along and gets scattered 2 comes along and gets scattered in this fashion but if this is a black box to you whatever is happening inside there then it is clear that this incident could also have happened. and this is the particles are exchanged here and you cannot tell which is which. So this is the reason why even in the dilute approximation when the de Broglie wavelengths of these particles is much smaller than the interparticle separation you can get away with this classical approximation you do not have to can classical statistics but you still have to take into account the indistinguishability factor by putting that n factorial by putting that in here because of this possibility even just instantaneous collisions could do this for you but in general you do not have to worry about quantum mechanics itself any further if this is the situation and what is the criterion for this situation to happen I would like this distance to be much smaller than this distance I would like the interparticle separation r sub s interparticle mean interparticle separation to be much much greater much much greater than lambda the de Broglie wavelength. If that is true I say I can get away with classical statistics with that fixed factor otherwise I have to do quantum statistics genuine quantum statistics but let us compute what this is this lambda de Broglie really depends on the energy of the particle and we use very elementary considerations so this is saying r sub s now what is the interparticle separation if you are going to put in a volume v you are going to put n particles then the volume available for each particle is v over n and therefore what is the linear dimension available for each particle the cube root of this guy the cube root of this is r sub s and this must be much much greater than de Broglie wavelength but the de Broglie wavelength is Planck's constant divided by the momentum what are we going to do for the momentum well the momentum can run over all possible values but on the average the momentum is given by the equipartition theorem which says at temperature t p squared over 2m average value equal to 3 halves k Boltzmann t this implies that p is of the order of m k t to the power half. modulo factors 3 halves 2 and all that but m we have to put in k Boltzmann this we have to put in this is the root mean squared momentum if you like and on this side you have v over n and therefore it says 1 is much much greater than this n over v is the number density n that and let us cube this whole thing over n k t. or this is much much less than 1 this is the criterion. 
So that is the criterion for classical statistics a very simple physical argument completely. It says if this is true, put it in and see what happens, then for a gas classical statistics is valid. Okay. I want you to put in the numbers for nitrogen for air at normal temperature and pressure. K is 3, 10 to the 20, 10 to the minus 23, T is 10 to the power 2, 300 Kelvin. The mass of a particle, the mass of a molecule is like what? 10 to the minus 26 kilograms hmm, for a nitrogen molecule. H is 10 to the minus 34 and there is a cube appearing there and then what is N? The number density. Well, you can find out because you know that 1 gram mole of each gas at normal temperature and pressure occupies whatever it is 22.4 something or the other. So, put that in and then you discover this number will be of the order of 10 to the minus 7 or something like that. Okay. So, that is exactly why it works, this one. but the moment that this is changed, it is going to flunk. The moment the density increases, certainly when it becomes liquid density, this is gone completely or, or what is the other instance in which it is going to change? If this guy is low if the temperature is low, it is tending towards absolute 0, this is going to go the other way. Huh? This number, this quantity here, it is called, it is what is it? It is the ratio of the interparticle separation, it is the ratio of the, the Broglie wavelength or thermal wavelength, this is called the thermal wavelength because I put in H over thermal energy there, is much, much smaller than this uh, interparticle separation. This is called the degeneracy factor. Yet another uh, misuse of the word degeneracy. It is not a very nice, uh, too many things are called degenerate, but this is one more of them. If this quantity becomes of order unity, then of course, you need quantum statistics and I might as well tell you right now, we will discover that if you look at uh, electrons in a metal near absolute 0 of temperature, this factor goes the other way, becomes of the order of 10 to the 3, it is much bigger than 1, it is smaller than 1. If you go to a neutron star, the density is so high that this factor becomes of the order of 10 to the 6 or 7 and so on. Then it is the extreme quantum limit, completely the other way. If you go to superfluid helium at 4 Kelvin, then this guy here, if you go to helium at very low temperatures, then this here again changes, the inequality flips over and you need quantum statistics. You cannot apply this as it stands to photons for the simple reason that I assumed m was not 0 you have to redo this whole business. And then you discover you are never going to be able to do it because in the case of photons, you cannot localize them at all, they have 0 rest mass. So, this argument is not valid and it is to start with intrinsically quantum mechanical. So, we will come to that, but uh, the check here is going to be precisely this. By the way, I want you to verify after putting in that n factor that this is essentially, this is closely related to the chemical potential of the classical ideal gas. You need a log somewhere and check this out. So, I hope I have tried to give you some idea of what is the assumptions that have gone in into deriving the classical equation of state, what is the physics that has gone in and how good the assumptions are and they really are very excellent as far as normal conditions are concerned. But we must be alive to the possibility that as soon as this changes, you have to apply the full power of quantum statistics. And the idea in quantum statistics would be, to put it in a nutshell, to do a row wise tally of the energy level of, of the possibilities rather than a column wise tally. Okay. And that will help us find out what happens. So, let me stop here.